to talk a bit about baptism um, and a little bit about division in the body of Christ, not necessarily in the local church, but the division that we see even throughout the churches, uh, from, even from, from, from the conception of the church in the first century till now, we have the same issues in the church. But I wanted to start today in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 to 12. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 to 12. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Now this is John the Baptist preaching. And his ministry was to prepare the way for the Messiah, to prepare the way for the Lord. And so he was going forth and getting people's hearts ready, getting them to repent, getting them to clean up their lives so when the Messiah came, they could accept him. And, and so he, he was the forerunner of the Christ, okay? And he's out in the wilderness baptizing people. And he says, I baptize you in water unto repentance. Say repentance. But he who comes after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so what I want to talk about this morning is the fact that Jesus' responsibility, what he wants to do, is he is actually here to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And sometimes the church is afraid of that. Some churches are afraid of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire. They don't fully understand it, and I hope we will after we get through this message. But uh, to baptize, the word baptize is the Greek word baptizo, and I'm probably not pronouncing it right, baptizo, and it actually means to make whelm, that is to fully make wet, okay? Okay. Um, it's a verb. It means to submerge or to engulf and to wash. It means to overcome utterly, to overwhelm. So that's why when we do water baptism, if you've been, if you've been baptized and you've been sprinkled, now I'm not going to make a deal out of that, but here at the crossroads, we want to do it as close to scripture as we can, and we want to just dunk you. We want to fully immerse you. We want to overwhelm you with water. And if you're a real good sinner, we'll hold you down to make sure you repent. <laughs> and, and we see you struggle. We'll let you up and go, are, 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 you, are you still a sinner? No, pastor. Um, but John the, Baptist, John the Baptist baptized with water unto repentance to utterly be overwhelmed with water. And that's what John the Baptist did. Jesus does something different. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He wants us to be overcome utterly. He wants to, us to be overwhelmed with God's Spirit. Because when you're overwhelmed with the Spirit of God, what happens is you become an overcomer. Amen? You want to be able to overcome life, if you want to live in victory, if you want to overcome sin, sickness, disease, if you want to see your family serve God, if you want to change society, you need to be overwhelmed with the Holy Ghost. And John said, the one who comes after me is mightier than I, because he's going to be baptized, with, he's going to baptize you not with water, but with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The word fire actually means, this Greek word is por, P-O-O-R. It actually means lightning. That's what it actually means. It's specifically talking about lightning. It's talking about a heat. It's talking about a light. It's talking about a brightness. That is, the Bible says Jesus has eyes like lightning. You read it, read it in the scripture. You cannot look at his glory. He's, when, when, he, when he met Paul on the, on the road to Damascus, Paul was thrown from his horse and he was blinded because of the brightness of God. See, when Jesus comes, he wants to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with lightning. And I've had encounters with God in times of prayer and seeking where I've literally felt electricity jolt me in my spirit and my life has been transformed. There's power. Wonder working power. Amen. Jesus is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. Men will baptize you in water, but Jesus will baptize you in the Holy Ghost. It's powerful. And the enemy wants us to be afraid. The enemy wants us to be afraid uh, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or afraid of the unknown. Can we just adjust this? And, and, and God does not want us to be. God wants us to be hungry for everything that he has for us. See, Jesus' role is twofold. Say twofold. He is the sacrificial lamb, but he's also the empowering Lord. Empowering Lord. 
And some Christians are okay with the, they understand that he's a sacrificial lamb, that he died so that they can be saved, but they, they, they don't know that he's the empowering Lord. That's some real feedback here. We're adjusting that? Yeah, trying. trying to, okay. Um, let's look at, look at Jesus' baptism. In John chapter 1, we're going to go to John chapter 1. Just finding my scripture here. John chapter 1, verse 29 to 34. Are you there? It says this. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Next verse. This is he who, who I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. All right? Verse 33. Okay. I did not know. Did I miss a verse? Sorry, go back, go back, go back, because I'm losing my, my place here. Okay, I did, I did not know him. So John says, I didn't know who the Messiah was. I did not know him, that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing in water. Next verse. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and remaining upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. All right? This is really important that we understand this because um, John, John is saying, Listen. The one who sent me, being the Father, told me that the one I see the Holy Spirit descend upon like a dove, this is the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Did he not say that? And when he introduced Jesus, he said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now I want to look at another passage of Scripture. Go with me to Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 to 5. How many know that once Jesus was baptized in water... You guys are familiar with the story. He came up and this, the heavens opened and the Lord said, this is my beloved son and I'm whom I'm well pleased. And then Jesus went into the wilderness and was tempted by the devil for 40 days. You guys remember the story. But what happened to John was John was arrested and John was thrown in prison. In Matthew chapter 11, <coughs> verse 1 to 5, it says, Now it came to pass... When Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and preach in other cities. And when John had heard in prison, where was John? Okay. About the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one or should we look for another? Now, this kind of amazes me because when he's baptizing me, he says, I'm sure this is the guy. This is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. God told me this is the guy. And now he's in prison. And he's going, are you the one or should we expect another? Suddenly he's doubting his faith. He's doubting the word that was spoken to him. Do you guys see that? And it amazes me. And he said to him, are you the coming one or should we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the dead hear, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up to life, the poor have the gospel preached to them. All right? Isn't that amazing that he doesn't, he doesn't criticize John and say, Oh, ye of little faith. See, John, John was going through some pretty, pretty hard persecution. And when you're in a dark place, sometimes your faith begins to, begins to go down a little bit. But Jesus didn't rebuke him. What Jesus said to him was, hey, go and tell John. The miracles are happening. Go and remind him that the one who comes after him baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And when he touches people, the Holy Spirit comes on them and recreates body parts, heals them, raises the dead. There's a new baptism. And I am the one that you, you, you don't doubt what you heard. And then he says... And tell John that he who is not offended is blessed. 
In other words, maybe John had some offense in his heart. Because when you're offended, what happens is, uh, metaphorically, and I, did, I looked this up in the Greek here, it hinders your right conduct, conduct of thought, and it causes you to stumble. Your thinking process goes out of whack when you're offended. And I don't know if he was offended. I'll have to ask him. I'm not going to throw that judgment on him. But it's funny that Jesus said, go and tell John that, G that I'm doing all of these miracles. And by the way, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And then look what he says here. And they departed. Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A, raid, uh, a reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go see, he asked. A prophet? Yes, and I say to you, more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. This is amazing. Jesus is saying to the multitudes, from the time of Adam all the way through, not one person was ever born through the birth canal that is as mighty as John the Baptist. Talk about honor. But then the next thing he says is so amazing. He says, but, you know, you draw a line in the center, you get a but. But, as my kids say, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's amazing. So Jesus is saying, after the cross, after the resurrection, people are going to be able to enter into the kingdom of God through the new birth experience. And he's saying the least of those in the church of the living God that's about to be birthed are going to be even greater than John the Baptist. Isn't that awesome? Why? Because now we can be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Before the cross, the Spirit of God came upon you and empowered you to do things for God. In the New Testament, the Spirit of God comes upon us, but also from within us. And we're baptized and fully immersed and overwhelmed by the Spirit of God. Isn't that good news? And Jesus said, greater. I want you to say that with me. Say, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. That's awesome. See, we're, see we're, we're, a, we're, we're a peculiar people. We're a new breed on the earth. Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. And we're the firstborn and regenerated from a sinful past. Isn't that awesome? We worship it. Such an awesome God. I want to look at a couple scriptures together because we, we, we understand here that John the Baptist understood that Jesus was coming after him to baptize in the Holy Ghost. But something happened in the early church, and I want to read about it together. Can we do that? Let's go to Acts chapter 18. <coughs> Acts chapter 18, verse 24 to 28. Now, <clears throat> I want to read about a man named Apollos. Okay? He was a great teacher. It says here, now a certain Jew named Apollos, born of Alexandria, was an eloquent man and mighty in Scripture. Say mighty in Scripture. Okay? So he, he, wasn't, he wasn't a novice. This, this was a man who was mighty in Scripture. He was eloquent speaker. Okay? And mighty in Scripture. He came to Ephesus. Next verse. And this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. So is he a Christian? Yes or no? Okay, he, he's been struck in the way of the Lord. He was, being, he was fervent in spirit. He was on fire for God. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. Hold on a second. He was fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. I want to put this forth that... In the church today, we have those who know only the baptism of John. They are those that actually are fervent in spirit. They, uh, they, they, they teach accurately the things of the Lord, uh, though they only know the baptism of John. Think about it. Verse 26, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue 
when Pastor Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And so I want to I want to say this, you know, you can preach the God, the, the word of God accurately. But how many know I want to be more accurate? There has to be a precision of understanding the word of God. And so we have preachers today who are preaching the word, their brothers and sisters in the Lord. They're preaching the word of God accurately. They, they, they're, they're fervent in spirit and, and they're teachers and, and they're mighty indeed. But they only know the baptism of John which is the baptism of water unto repentance. This is serious. This is good. Verse 27. And when he desired to cross to Acacia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scripture that Jesus is the Christ. And I love my Baptist brothers and all those who are, you know, think that there's no second blessing. I have no problem. They're, they're great at refuting. They're great at going into the word and proving the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. We're brothers in arms. Amen. So this is not a critical message. I just want to get to the truth. Acts chapter 19 and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper region, came to Ephesus, and this is where Apollos was teaching, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And look at this. So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Hold on a second, break down. John the Baptist's ministry was what? John the Baptist's ministry was to, to say, listen, I'm here to prepare the way of the Lord, for I baptize you with water unto repentance. But there's one coming greater. This is the guy right here. God just talked to me. And he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Somehow John continued, his disciples continued his ministry after he died. And they forgot to mention there's more. And we have the same problem today. People like, I went to this church, this is the way I've been taught, this is the way my grandfather. And, and when you start talking about the Holy Spirit and fire and deeper dimensions in God, it's like a wall goes up and they block their ears and say, no, 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 it can't be, it can't be. I'm a disciple of John. I'm a disciple of John. And so are we disciples of John or are we disciples of Jesus? That's the question. So he said to the disciples... I'll go back and read verse 2 again. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they were already Christians. They believed in Jesus. So they said to him, we have not even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. Which just boggles my mind. How can you not hear? And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. As far as I'm concerned, John's ministry should have been shut down. And I think John would have shut it down because it, it was irrelevant. It was, it was a dead work. It was a, it was a dead movement. It was there to prepare the way. But once the Lord came, shut it down. And he died and his disciples continued to preach and do the work of God through this old wineskin. This old model. And then Paul said... Verse 3, and he said to them, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And then Paul said, John indeed baptizes you with water unto repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. The whole purpose of John the Baptist was to point you to Jesus. And you haven't even heard about the Holy Ghost? The very thing Jesus came to bring? Something's missing. Verse 5, and then when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Man, they were a happy bunch. In the Bible, we go on to read, it says there was 12 in all, and they began to preach the word, and miracles were working through the, the hands of Paul, and handkerchiefs were handed out. I mean, power of God moved, the whole city was saved. For two years, revival broke out in that city, because someone was willing to say, hey, you know what, maybe there's more than just this water baptism thing. Maybe there's, there's a deeper dimension in God. Amen. And we are a church that says, and you know what I find with people that are filled with the Holy Ghost, is that they're always looking for a more accurate way. They know the word accurately. You know, we have, we're part of MFI, Ministers Fellowship International. And you know, we've had a few of them come in here and minister. And then my wife and I and the elders, you know, uh, Peter and, and Anita and a few others have gone down to Georgia 
to learn about divine healing. So when I'm telling these ministers that are coming to visit here that, hey, we, we, were, we were down in Georgia learning about healing, and that they're all like, yeah, we want to go. That's awesome. We want more. You know, Yeah, give us some information. It's not this, no, that we don't believe in that. That's not our doctrine here. You hear what I'm saying? Because those who are baptized with the Holy Ghost are hungry. Say, God, I want, I want more. I want to I be continually filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? Remember this. Man baptizes you with water. But Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Ghost. The evidence is prophecy. It's boldness. It's tongues. It's, it's just an explosion that happens on your life. And God wants us to live in that realm of being overwhelmed by the Spirit of God. Amen? So we can be overcomers. I wanted to take a few minutes this morning to talk about the Methodist Church. Did you get that uh, picture? Because um, many times what, hap what starts in revival turns out to just be a, a maintenance program. Just maintain what we have. It can happen in any denomination. It can happen in any... And, you know, I know what, uh, churches that... Um, uh, Methodist churches that are on fire for God. So you can't... I'm not saying that the Methodist church isn't on fire for God. I'm just saying that... I'm giving you an example, okay? But this is John Wesley. And um, he was, he was a, mighty, a mighty man of God. And he preached the word of God. Um, and I, t I taught about revival history when I was in Bible school. So I'm going to take, give you a little bit of a history lesson this morning so we can understand uh, what happened. Uh, he, he was born in England. And this was back in 17, uh, 1703. June 1703 uh, was the 17th he was born. But at the time of John Wesley's birth, England was characterized by poverty, gin, and filthy living conditions. Okay? You know, we forget that, you know, we think, oh, okay, we're living in a, in a bad time. Well, we are. But there was other times in history that were pretty bad, too. And you know what? The Bible says in Romans 5.20. Okay, we bring that verse up here. It says, um, Romans 5.20. Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound, but where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And so, you know, in John's time, there, there, there was filth, there was poverty, there was... There was, uh, people were getting drunk all the time. There was no running water. There was no soap. Life expectancy was on average in the mid-40s. Diseases like smallpox and plague had no cure. In the workplace, there was swearing and physical abuse every day. For fun, people loved to torture animals in the streets. They would give babies gin to keep them quiet. There were very few schools. Only the select rich people were educated. Murder and suicide were calm. And in other words, John Wesley was born into a morally corrupt society. And England was in such a bad state that it was, wasn't far from a revolution. And this is, I mean, it was bad. And um, he was born on June 17, uh, 1703. He was uh, the 15th of 19 children, lots of kids, of which nine died in infancy, because back in those days, you lost a lot of kids. And um, he, he lived in that kind of an environment. And as he grew up, in, in, when he, in 1728, he was ordained as a minister by Reverend Hayward, and he was there, he was asked some questions about his faith. Now, I want to say this. From the time that he, he became a minister, it was 10 years from that time until he actually got born again. Until he experienced rebirth. Well, he, he claims that. Now, I want, I want to show you something here. He started a club called the Holy Club. The Holy Club. Yeah. In 1728, John's brother Charles started the Holy Club with 25 members. The purpose of it was to reinforce faith through scriptural study and to measure the quality of holiness in each member. How would you like that? You have a checklist and you get together with your church and they say, okay, well, you didn't do so well here. We'll give you a little check. And they'd measure themselves by themselves. Sounds like a great club. And, um, the purpose was to re reinforce faith through scriptural study. And the club helped form, in John's mind, some of the doctrines of holiness and perfection that he would later preach. Okay? And he was very methodical in everything that he did. That's why they called it the Methodist Church when he started it. Um, but that, that was... Uh, <laughs> when we move, move forward here, I'm just trying to give you just a summary here. Ten years later, 
Upon returning home, two brothers engaged a lot in soul searching became, uh, because they knew that they did not have the faith that the Morovians had, okay? Uh, the Morovians were a missionary group that they traveled with. Um, and I, actually, I'm just going to I'm just going to read this because it's very important that you get this. Several months after uh, John's father's death, the brothers John and Charles went to Georgia to preach to the Indians. The trip was disappointing. The Georgians didn't like Wesley's strictness or his preaching against sin. Because that's what he, he preached against sin all the time. During the Wesley's journey to and from America, there are Morovians on board the ship. John and Charles both realized that the Morovians had much deeper relationship with God than they did because the Morovians were not in fear during the great storm they experienced while on the ship. Instead, they sang hymns and praised God through the storms. Wesley was amazed on his return to America. He said, I went to America to convert the Indians, and now who was going to convert me? So I'm not even saved now, right? I want what these guys have, okay? So upon returning home, the two brothers engaged a lot in soul searching because they did not have the faith that the Morovians had. John and Charles met a Morovian in England named Peter Buller, and John was amazed by his contagious faith and calm assuring, assuring personality. So this was 10 years after he became a preacher. On May 24th, 1738, John went to a meeting at Aldersgate Street, attended mostly by Morovians, and at the meeting, someone read Luther's preference to the Book of Romans. The reader was describing the changes which God worked in the heart through faith in Christ, John Wesley recorded in his journey that he felt his heart strangely warmed by it. And now he knew that God had taken his sins away and he had saved him from the law of sin and death. This revolutionized his life completely. Now this was on May 24th, 1738. He was a preacher for 10 years and he didn't get salvation. It was all about right and wrong and sin and trying to measure your life by other people. And, and it, I mean, isn't that awful? But 10 years later, he gets genuine faith. One year after that, on January 1st, 1739, John Wesley attended a meeting of one of the Methodist societies. George Whitfield was also there. The power of God came on them around 3 a.m. They were rejoicing and some were being slain to the ground. Both Wesley and Whitfield received a powerful anointing to preach. It is said that this was the beginning of the Great Awakening. And um, I actually had, see where I put that? I actually had their, um, what John wrote, John wrote in his diary. Listen to this. January 1st, 1739, John Wesley wrote in his diary, Mr. Hall, Kinchin, Ingham, Whitfield, Hutchins, and my brother Charles were present at our love feast in Fetter Lane with about 60 of our brethren about 3 o'clock in the morning as we were continuing instant in prayer. See, they were praying and seeking God. They were hungry. The power of God came mightily upon us insomuch that many cried out for exceeding joy. Many fell to the ground as soon as we were recovered a little bit from the awe and the amazement of his presence of his majesty we broke out with one voice we praise thee O god we acknowledge thee to be lord one year after john is strangely warmed his heart he gets saved he gets baptized with the holy ghost and the great awakening begins to happen see jesus didn't he didn't come to baptize us with water he came to baptize us with the holy ghost and with fire isn't that good news? And so what the enemy wants us to do is he wants us to, um, to forget that. Just like he did in the early church. Oh, I didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. What's that? And there's people in the church, you know, the moment you get saved, the Spirit, you get a deposit of the Spirit. You're, you're a child of God. You have the Holy Ghost. But there's a second blessing called the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire that God wants you to have so you can live victorious, that you can, you can be witnesses for Him, that you can live in the miraculous so that you're not just saved and on your way to heaven. You're an overcomer. And you can do what Jesus said. You can join partnership with Him and you can destroy the works of the devil. You try to do that without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. My brother was telling me about a Baptist missionary that went down to, um, I think it was Haiti, and he was trying to preach the gospel. And he, had, and he loved the Lord. He was, and he was going out, and he was preaching, and, and, and a storm came and blew his house down, and his kids were getting sick, and uh, he was just, he was burnt out, and destroyed. his life was being destroyed. He couldn't get the message out, because there, there's lots of voodoo and witchcraft in Haiti, and they were putting curses on him. 
But then he got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he's taken over the whole area. Because he said, Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high that you might be witnesses. We need the power of God. We need, Jesus. We need to come to Jesus and say, God, I'm hungry to be baptized afresh with your spirit. Jesus, you're the baptizer. I make myself available. I'm hungry for all that heaven has. And when we have that attitude and we come hungry, God will fill us. Will he not? Yeah. Amen. I don't want to spend too much time with John Wesley, but. He had nowhere to preach because now he's baptized in the Holy Ghost and all these people think he's a nutcase. And so Whitfield, his buddy, who also was touched by the Holy Ghost, began to preach in the open air. And after several weeks, thousands were in, in attendance in a single meeting. He'd be out preaching by the side of the road and a thousand people would come and listen to the preaching of the Word of God under the baptism of the Holy Ghost. On March... 31st, 1739, Whitfield sent for Wesley to come to one of the meetings. Wesley was, thought it was improper. He said, could souls actually be one outside of the church? Can you do that in a field? But he came, and after praying about it, before long, Wesley was holding outdoor meetings as well. And he would stress the importance of having the assurance of salvation and a life of holiness. In the meantime, the state churches were being emptied, and Wesley was now being called a madman. Wesley would say to the religious people, it's nonsense for a woman to consider herself virtuous because she's not a prostitute, or a man honest because he does not steal. May the Lord preserve me from such a poor, starved religion. And so he was preaching holiness, but he was doing it with the fire of the Holy Ghost, with tears and with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that's what God wants from the church today. He wants us to preach holiness. He wants us to preach the truth. But we need to do it fully immersed and overwhelmed by the Spirit. Amen? In the meetings, criminals were being converted and they were taking steady jobs. Drunkards were also being converted. Wesley used to see signs all over the place saying, Drunk, one pence. Dead drunk, two pence. Straw, free. <laughs> so people just got drunk all the time. And, they would, and you know, there was such a harvest of souls, one for the Lord, through this revival. It was the greatest revival since the first century. New converts pledged to never drink again. In the meetings, people fell down as if dead. Some fell screaming for mercy because of the presence of God coming down in the meetings. Wesley himself had not only found Jesus, but it was a vehicle in which to spread the gospel. How many want to see a great awakening? I want to see it. man. And if we're going to see that, then we need to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And what happened was John and Whitfield and Wesley, these guys, these guys all birthed revivals. They were all in that meeting that night, seeking God steadfastly in prayer. And at three in the morning, the power of God came. And they were all became revivalists and preached the gospel and changed the face of the globe. Isn't that awesome? Because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You want to hear a bit about the persecution they endured? Because we talk about persecution. Well, someone might not like what I have to say. Okay, John Wesley's life was threatened many, many times. The threats came from mobs, which were made up of people who had never heard Wesley preach, and also from religious people. Religious people were not directly involved in the mobs, but they would excuse the mobs for their action from behind the pulpit. They were also involved in many other ways. In August 1748, Reverend George White, who drank himself to death, by the way, issued a proclamation inviting recruits to join a mob against Wesley. They were invited to a bar where each recruit was given a pint of beer, and this mob eventually struck Wesley violently in the face and later beat him to the ground. With all the mobs, Wesley always remained amazingly calm. He never lost control, and at times he would get struck by stones while preaching. Wiping the blood off from his face, he'd continue to preach without frowning. That is the power of the Holy Ghost. Smack. You know. Oh, where was I? You must be born again. And we, we're worried about people not liking us. As the power of revival grew, many times the crowds in the meeting would deal with disturbers. On one occasion, a clergyman tried to attack Wesley with a club, but a group of women stopped him and dragged him away. I mean, I would have loved to be in that church. Could you imagine? A bunch of women get up. You're not touching him. You know? <laughs> Boom. Let's take him out. Right? Revival can be messy. Another time, a, a, 
A papist began to blow a horn when Wesley started preaching. The man in the crowd ripped the horn away from the man and knocked him to the ground. Methodists themselves, however, offered no resistance to the mobs because they felt that this would injure their honor. Later on in life, the persecution stopped and Wesley was treated as a celebrity more than anything else. Through his response toward these mobs, he had created a new definition of courage and bravery in the hearts of the people of England. He always used to say, I love my enemies. I want to be baptized with that kind of fire. Amen? And we need to be hungry for that. And when we are, then we'll be able to change the face of Trenton, Ontario, Canada, the world. Amen? You know, God is faithful. And I'm not going to go too much further with Wesley, but as you study his life, um, I want to read some of the fruits of Wesley's life. Number one, he abol the abolishment of slavery. God used them in that. In 1772, Wesley read a book about slavery, which greatly affected him. As a result, he spent the next two years researching information about slavery. In 1774, he wrote his own book called Thoughts Upon Slavery. This proverb uh, proved to be one of the most far-reached studies ever done on slavery. And because of that, it influenced the decisions that were being made. It was awesome. The education system. Before the evangelical revival, many school teachers were, uh, could, were semi-literate themselves. They couldn't even read themselves. Only a select few attended school. All right? At this time, a man named um, Rakus started Sunday schools, which John Wesley supported and sponsored. It was due to Wesley's influence that the schools became successful. At Sunday school, children were taught to read and write, and they were able to read the Bible. See, the, teach, the, 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 the churches were teaching kids how to read and write. The schools couldn't do it, but they did it because of John Wesley. By 1786, there was over 200,000 children attending Sunday school. And by 1831, long after Wesley's death, 1,250,000 children were involved in the programs. Prison systems. He went and he actually raised money for blankets for the prisoners and frequently visited the prisoners, as did his associates, brought humanitarian aid. They... Um, the uh, historians credit John Wesley as being one of the greatest factors in the pr prevention of England as a civil revolution similar to the one in France. Okay, so he was part of the revolution. Social reform. I mean, he did so much because he was baptized with the Holy Ghost. At the end of his life, Wesley rose at 4 a.m. every day until the end of his life. And by the time he died, he had preached between 42,000 and 50,000 sermons. He had, a, he had part in writing 333 books. He also wrote countless numbers of tracts. And at the age of 85, he said in his journal, it annoys me that I can not spend any more than 15 hours a day reading and writing before it bothers my eyes. I mean, this man was possessed by the Holy Ghost. And he changed the nation. You know what? Many of his churches today, not all of them, but many of them have just fa fell into maintenance mode. And have just become religious. You know, we could do that too. At the cross. We can do that. Any church can do that. We have to make a decision that God, Jesus, you are the baptism, baptizer in the Holy Spirit. And I want all that heaven has for me. Amen.